actually going to visit the town of Hill Valley from we'll Back to the Future. We're going to go to Old Chicago from The Sting and to Europe to from All Quiet on the Western Front. We're going to visit the small town of Mayfield where Wally and the Beaver grew up. We'll take you... We have located behind the windows that chart appearance was created through black spray paint and you'll see that all this house really is is a facade made out of non-combustible materials Ooh. now off the jerry side of the tram you'll see our makeup and costume departments this is really where our actors start they their day before they were proud stafford virginia i'm sorry stafford virginia oh no i heard you i'm just sorry you're from stafford virginia <laughs> uh, Lou, i want you to help me demonstrate something here i want you to take one of those cards in each of your hands and hold them up over your head. Now, everybody watch the center screen over here. We're going to destroy this illusion. Lou, go ahead and drop those cards. Uh, they fall to the wall. Kind of destroys the illusion. But you did a great job. How about a big round of applause for our volunteer, Lou? Lou, get good and comfortable. We have 20 more groups coming in here, OK? So this effect was greatly improved for When the Clouds Roll By, a 1919 film by Douglas Fairbanks. Fairbanks built a room that could rotate 360 degrees. By rotating the camera along with the room, he could make it appear as though the room were standing still. Actually, Fairbanks is running in... Wintry mountain scene. Right? Wrong. It's a miniature. Another special effect of creative movie making. These next scenes are so realistic, it's hard to believe that an actor never placed a foot on these sets. By building miniatures instead of full-size sets, filmmakers can take almost any point of view and create events that would otherwise be too expensive, dangerous, or destructive to shoot. These buildings are part of the most complex miniature set ever constructed. One of two built for Steven Spielberg's film, 1941. This Pacific Ocean Park set was originally 120 feet by 90 feet. Our stage can only hold 50 feet of it. The greatest effect came when a Japanese submarine blasted the Ferris wheel. Ah. It is often too expensive to transport a cast and a crew to a faraway location. Perhaps a location no longer exists, or maybe it never existed at all. Such obstacles never stood in the way of imaginative filmmakers. They simply uh, invented the matte painting process. In this process, a very realistic painting is combined with live action in a perfectly matching blend of artwork and cinematography. 
The painted portion fills in details that didn't exist. The final result? Movie magic on a grand scale. These scenes used what film technicians call a traveling mat. It's a technique that allows movie makers to put people and objects into moving scenes in a very realistic way. Several different types of Kodak film were used to create the traveling mat sequence that you're now looking at. Kodak is the only company to provide. Volunteer Franklin on the stage. Franklin, you ready to go? Okay, now when a traveling mat is used with a video camera, the process is called chroma key. One very important ingredient in this process is the blue screen you see coming down behind Franklin here. The camera will electronically eliminate the color blue and wipe out the background. If you look overhead on the left, you'll see what the camera sees. Overhead on the right, that's what the camera uh, does. The blue background has been eliminated. That's where our background film is going to go. So now, everybody watch the center screen. Franklin, you watch the TV screen down there on the floor. We're going to put all these elements together. And there goes Franklin flying over the San Fernando Valley. See yourself on TV? <laughs> How about a big wave out at the audience, Franklin? Wave out there. There you go. No hands. Look, Mom. Smile. Don't smile too big, though. You get bugs in your teeth. <laughs> Oh, terrific. A star is born. He comes in for a perfect landing. How about a big round of applause for our volunteer, Franklin? He did a great job. Franklin, I want you to come down these steps. Come right here with me, right in front of the bike. We're going to do a little mini interview. Franklin, now you said you're seven years old. Is that right? Okay. Are you married? No. Have you got a girlfriend? Yes. <laughs> the things children will say. Okay. Franklin, one more very important question I need to ask you. Franklin, what's your very favorite movie of all time? What is it? E.T. Isn't that amazing without any prompting whatsoever? Okay, Franklin, one more thing you need to do is take a bow. Do you know how to take a bow? Okay, face the audience, take a bow. And they're going to burst into thunderous applause. On screen, I'm going to match their footsteps right here on this carpet. Then at the end of the clip, when the bad guy goes flying through this window, well, I'm going to recreate that for you here today, too. But um, there's a couple of ways I can do it. I want you folks to help me decide. First, I can... Um, <laughs> throw my uh, easily bruised body through this window. But for the very same effect, <laughs> yeah. I can take my three and a half pound brick and hurdle it through the window. So how many for the brick? <laughs> the body. Let's go with the body. It was close, but I think the brick won. So you watch those screens. No. Watch my monitor below. Here we go. There's the door. And here's her body. <laughs> <laughs> no, here goes Don. Okay. Okay, now, Philip, go check around the corner. I think there's food over there. Go on. Go see. There he goes. Oh, help yourself. I think he's done. Uh-oh, look out. Oh, okay, Don got him. Okay, now, you know, I think my cue's coming up. The other day, though, I threw the brick from over here. It didn't give a very good effect, so I thought maybe if I... I missed it. It was the third time this week I missed my cue. It started making really bad when I missed my cue. <laughs> the old foam rubber brick in the audience. Can I have my brick back, please? This is not Dodger Stadium. Thank you. And there was still one sound effect missing from that. Does anybody know what it was? It was the gunshots. Gunshots presents... As you can see, a computerized camera is now moving the length of the ship against a black background. By adding a field of stars, we now create the illusion of the ship flying through space. Demonstration complete. Thank you, Hal. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the actual model of the Discovery used in MGM's 2010. But you know, one of the most exciting effects in that film didn't involve models. It involved live actors in a spacewalk. And are you wondering what happened to our two volunteers? Look to your right. <laughs> there they are, just hanging around backstage waiting to come out. We have Chris and Craig. Which one? Where's Chris? There's Chris in the front, and Craig is in the back. Can you give us a wave, Craig? They're both alive. They're going to come out, and we're going to film our two actors with two cameras, all controlled by computer, combine their live images with actual footage from the movie 2010 to create one exciting spacewalk sequence live before your eyes. It looks like they're ready to go, so here's the setup for the scene you're about to see. You've arrived in the spaceship Leonov and established an orbit around the planet Jupiter where some strange things have been going on. Their mission is to reach the other ship, the Discovery, to see why its systems have shut down. In order to do that, they'll perform a simple spacewalk. So now, watch the screens in front of you and the live action above the stage as we recreate this scene from MGM's 2010. We have lights, cameras, and action. Establish orbit, please. Orbit established. Prepare to engage mission. Colonel Broloski, come in. Colonel, are you ready? 
I, I don't think I want to go through with this. You don't have any choice. Stand by. I'm engaging the doors. Rolovsky, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Officer Kerner, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I hear you. they made it. How about a round of applause for Chris and Craig? Good work, guys. Can you turn around and take a bow for us now? Can you give us a big bow? Come on. <laughs> Ding, starring Robert Redford and Paul Newman. We're now pulling into the town of Hill Valley from Back to the Future. This off the road rolling off to my side of the tram. You might better remember as the malt shop from that movie where Marty McFly met his father George McFly for the first time as a teenager back in the 1950s in Back to the Future. And the courthouse off to Richard's side of the tram was the clock tower in that movie. Now, there is no clock up there anymore. It was just a prop. It's sitting back in our prop department right now. But that scene called for Christopher Lloyd to be hanging from that clock tower to harness the bolt of lightning that was to strike at exactly 10.04 p.m. to warn Michael J. Fox back to the future. However, he wasn't actually hanging from a clock tower on the top of that courthouse. He, we had made a simulated clock tower inside of a sound stage. He was only about two feet off the ground, so he didn't have a very long fall to go there. In fact, it was down that very street to the left of the courthouse that Michael J. Fox drove that DeLorean back to the future. Finally, one of the last film sets we do still have from Back to the Future is the gas station. You'll see off to my side of the tram. Past. As he pulled into Hill Valley of 1955, what he saw were about six gas station attendants rush out to help a customer that pulled into that gas station. Oh, yeah, you knew you'd never see that in the 80s, that he must have been living in the past. Now, if you didn't see Back to the Future, but this area still looks familiar to you, it was inside that courthouse that Gregory Peck defended his client, Boo Radley, in To Kill a Mockingbird, and Spencer Tracy did the very same thing in Inherit the Wind. This whole area in here was seen as the city of Fairvale in Psycho and Psycho 2, oh. and as the small town of Mayfield in Leave it to Beaver. It's also being used in the new Leave it to Beaver. And it was also seen as the city of Kingston Falls in the Warner Brothers film Gremlins. If you remember in that movie, it took place in the winter. There was snow all over the ground. However, it's awfully hard to make it snow here in Southern California, especially in the middle of the summer. That's exactly when this movie was filmed. Well, we just laid movie snow over this entire area. We dressed all of our actors and actresses up in woolen caps and parkas and mittens. Gave the illusion of a wintertime scene. However, it was over 100 degrees on the days that we did the filming for those scenes, so I don't think our actors were very happy with their attire then. And it was down this street now that our tram is sitting on that Robert Preston led his 76 trombones in Warner Brothers' The Music Man. So you can see we can use a lot of the same areas for different movies and television shows. 
However, a lot of the filming that our studio does is not done here on our lot, but it's done on location. For example, the Equalizer in New York City, Magnum P.I. in Hawaii, Miami Vice in Miami, Florida. Michael J. Fox's newest release, it's not so new anymore, The Secret of My Success was filmed on location in New York City. But that can become a very time-consuming process. So instead of filming on location, that's when we'll just recreate an area right here on our lot. And that's what we've done right now. We've recreated the Brooklyn Bridge. Right here inside soundstage number 86 is the largest one we have here. Now keep those flashes ready on your cameras, folks. I heard there was a little destruction going on in here. And I'm not quite sure what they meant by that. Uh oh, that's where we are. building again off to my side of the tram marked County Cornhouse was from the movie Dirty Harry starring Clint Eastwood. That was the site of a bank robbery. And that small gray church you see right next door was from the motion picture entitled Change of Habit starring Mary Tyler Moore and the king of rock and roll himself, Mr. Elvis Presley. And finally again, off to my side of the tram, the building marked for Boston, or actually it's not marked anything anymore. It's that gray stone building. You might better remember from the Touchstone film, Outrageous Fortune, that Mither and Shelley Long actually batted it out yeah. over a boyfriend on those very steps. This street was seen as Old Chicago in the Sting, as London, England in an episode of Murder, she wrote, and most recently as Seattle, Washington in Harry and the Hendersons. You can see some of these buildings up to Richard's side have been dressed a little bit. That is for the law in Harry McGraw. This is the city of Boston in here for that television series. Yeah. And the stone building off to Richard's side again with a large archway was the site of Kojak's police department from that TV series starring Telly Savalas. And we've chosen to call this street New York Street. It can actually depict any metropolitan area. But I suppose we've chosen that name because if you really were in New York City, to get out of that city, you'd have to cross one of their world-famous bridges. So here at Universal Studios, we have our own bridge. We're going to take you across it today. You can get a nice picture of our back lot from up here. Now, this is actually a pretty sentimental part of our tour. Because you see, this bridge is very, very old. It was built way back in 1915 for the silent film era. In fact, Carl Lemley, Universal's founder, was even present when this bridge was built. Now, I know you probably think that this doesn't look like the sturdiest thing you've ever seen, but believe me, folks, we go across this oh bridge thousands of times every day, and there's nothing, nothing at all wrong with it. It's just old. Oh, oh my God. No. Um, Richard? Richard, did, did, did you just see those two beams fall down on the bridge? Oh, there goes another one. Did you see them? Well, we can't go across the bridge today. There's nothing. 
holding it up. We should go the back road. Let's go the... Richard, the back road. Oh, no. <laughs> you think it's going to be all right? All right. I don't know, Richard. It didn't sound like this this morning. Oh, no. It's okay? All right. Okay. All right, well, you might want to go ahead and get that picture while we are up here. It's one of the few spots on our back. Oh! oh my God. Hold on! Okay, we're all right. Okay, folks, hold on. Guessed by now, this bridge was not built back in 1950. In fact, it was built just a few years ago for use in some of the movies and television shows we've done right here. You might remember it from The Bionic Woman, starring Lindsay That's Wagner, scary. or even from The Six Million Dollar Man, starring Lee Majors. Now, back then, those two bionic people used to just kind of push that bridge back together all alone. But you'll see that our bridge actually does reconstruct right. itself with the help of hydraulics. There it goes. Now that area that we have our bridge sitting in looks very isolated and remote, like it's a very secluded area for filming. However, sometimes... Oh, thank you. Wait a minute, Mark. Thanks. Look, Christy. No, 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 no. Look at that. <laughs> look, look over here, look. You don't like me? <laughs> oh, okay. Hey! Okay. Currently meant by the rain, it's raining on the driver's side of the tram, but it's not raining on my side of the tram. Hence the 50 50 chance of rain. Let's just hope we don't get any of those flash floods, though. Where? Oh. So you go up, man. Yep. Yeah. 
It's a bar that comes up and stops the water. Okay, man, I'll let Angie see in there. Okay, we are going to pass now down through the Red Sea, but please keep your arms and legs in the tram at all times. the driver's side of the tram, you'll see a home perched up there on the hill. <laughs> it's featured in the film Weird Science with Kelly LeBrock and Anthony Michael Hall. And that little pond in front of it, that's the ominous Black Lagoon from The Creature from the Black Lagoon. Now in that film, the actor that played the creature named What's Rico Browning could hold his breath actually up to five minutes because we could have used scuba gear, otherwise the bubbles would have been seen. For this patch of woods on my side of the tram, that was the only jungle that Elmo Lincoln ever saw. He was our first Tarzan. That's all he had to swing around in. And you'll notice many of the trees are on platforms. That way we can move them around to facilitate the crew and the camera and the director. And then that grassy area you see on the driver's side of the tram, we often turn that into uh, golf courses or cemeteries. And that's where Doyle Lonigan, played by Robert Shaw, played golf in The Sting. It's also where Alfred Hitchcock made a cemetery for his last film here called Family Plot. Now what he did was inscribe the names of his critics on the tombstone, sort of as a little joke. I don't know how they felt about it, however. On my side of the tram, you see these facades here. We can make that look like a prestigious area of just about any city in the country with a little dressing that can be Park Avenue and the grassy area across. We use this area for embassies for movies. Dabney Coleman parachuted into this area for Cloak and Dagger and then entered the embassy on my side of the tram. Now, on the driver's side of the tram, you're going to get your first views of an area we call Little Europe, where much of All Quiet on the Western Front was filmed, our first Academy Award winner for Best Picture. It's, water it's interesting to know the tram, you're going to notice some buildings. Now, the doors of those buildings are a lot smaller than they should be. Now, the reason for that is it made the cowboys back then look a lot bigger and brawnier than they really were. Well, on the driver's side of the tram, the doors are a lot bigger than they should be. And you guessed it, that made the Western women look small and petite. And then the Western cowboys could come heroically to the rescue to save the day. On my side of the tram, you'll get another chance to view that barn we saw a This is the other side of it. That's also where Francis the Talking Mule lived in our serial movies, Francis. Now, the way we got him to talk was by smearing peanut butter inside his mouth and along his gums. He then moved his lips and his teeth to get rid of the peanut butter, and then we dubbed in the voice of Chill Wills. So I'm sorry to dispel the illusion, but uh, that mule never really did talk. We're now going to enter the town of Amity Island, inspired by Amity Island, Island from Steven Spielberg's blockbuster 1975 hit, Jaws. Whoa. Now, you may remember that film. The entire area was terrorized by Great Lake Shark. We've been having some shark troubles of our own, so keep your cameras ready. On my side of the train, we have a lake here, and there's a man fishing out there. Excuse me, sir, what, what are you doing out there? We've been having shark problems, and I see a shark right now. Sir, please get out of the water immediately. Your life is in danger. Sir, please, he's heading right towards your boat. Sir. Oh, no, I have a bad feeling about this. There you go. Back part here, Dave. Watch, Angie. You got him. Oh, here you are. Help, help, help. Now, we have a yellow barrel out there. We faded it with speed. Hopefully, the shark will take that instead of taking us. Keep an eye on it. He's got the barrel, and he's got the whole dock too. Watch out, everyone. to everyone to make sure the person you were with is still there. I hope we didn't lose anyone. Now, if you look back at our shark, you'll see he's doing the backstroke. He's very versatile. We taught him that. Does anybody know what that mechanical shark's name is? No, his name is Bruce. That was named after three different sharks. That was quite a problem for them to build those sharks in a real house in Texas, entirely inside our sound stage number 12. That's our largest sound stage. We built it like a dollhouse. That way we could get into any area we wanted. And then we reassembled it here in the back lot, where that backyard's been featured in Murder, She Wrote. That's Angela Lansbury's backyard. Now, if that house was recognizable to many of you, then we're about to find some more recognizable homes as we pass by some homes from some of your favorite TV shows and movies. 
On the driver's side of the tram, that house with the brick foundation, the brown one with the white trim, that's where James Stewart lived in the movie Harvey. And there Harvey is on the doorstep right now. See, he's a six and a half foot invisible rabbit. Now the house to the right of that on the driver's side of the tram with the one with the stained glass windows, that's 1313 Mockingbird Lane from the Munsters Ooh. with Fred Gwynn and Yvonne DiCarlo. Wow. On my side of the tram, there's the brick house with the green shutters. Now that's where Marcus Welby had his office, but more importantly, that's where Beaver Cleaver lived in Leave It to Beaver with Jerry Mathers, Tony Dow, and Barbara Billingsley. It's currently getting use in the new Leave It to Beaver, which is filming for Ted Turner's Superstation out of Atlanta at WTBS as a cable station, so many of you may be familiar with that show. Now the area of the lot we're heading into now can be made to look like just about any small town in the country. If you look on the driver's side of the tram across the circle, you'll see a colonial mansion. That was built in the early 1900s for the film Uncle Tom's Cabin. It was also the sanitarium in Harvey. They wanted to send James Stewart there, although they weren't successful. On the other side of the circle, it's now on the driver's side of the tram, you see some storefronts. Now, we often use those to create the small town settings. This entire area was covered with fake snow for an episode of Amazing Stories called Sand 85. That was Steven Spielberg's television series from a couple years back. On my side of the tram, you'll see a lavender building with a carport. That was featured in the film The Thrill of It All with Doris Day and James Garner. Now, in that film, James Garner drove his car through the garage and into a swimming pool in the backyard. Now, as you notice, there was no swimming pool at that home, only a 30-foot cliff behind. So that took some careful ingenuity on the part of the filmmakers. What they had to do was film James Garner here in the back lot, driving through the garage. They then built a swimming pool inside a soundstage and had him continue to drive into it there in the soundstage. Now that creates a problem on the part of the filmmakers, for often interior scenes are shot on separate days as exterior scenes. They have special people who are called continuity people. And these people make sure that the actors are wearing the same clothes and have the same hairstyles as well as the same makeup when they're shooting later scenes on different days that have to match earlier scenes. Otherwise, it would look funny when you're watching a TV show or a movie and the actor's clothing changes colors during the middle of the scene. Now, we're heading into the wilderness area of our back lot. We purposely allow this area to be overgrown. That way, our production people can come back here and make it look like anything they want. They can make it look like a rainforest, a regular forest, or even a field. Now what they'll do, they'll come back here, decide what they need, they'll have to build any sets that need to be built, set up any sprinkler equipment or anything else they need, call on members of the greenery department, and then when they're done, they'll break everything down, send it back to its proper location, and let this area return to its normal state. Now, the Chicken Ranch was a very noticeable home, but imagine driving up this home back in 1960. That's exactly what Janet Leigh did in the classic Albert Hitchcock film, Psycho. Oh, if you look to the driver's side of the tram, you'll get your first view today of the Psycho home, and right below it, the Bates Motel. Bates Motel. Now, Janet Leigh made a very unfortunate decision and decided to spend the night there in room number one of the hotel, where she met her demise. Now, that scene where she met her end was a very violent scene. It had a lot of controversy then and still does now. Now, believe it or not, that scene was only 45 seconds long, but it took over seven days to shoot and over 70 different camera setups. Also, Anthony Perkins, who played Norman Bates and Janet Leigh, were not even present for the shooting of those scenes. Those were both body doubles. They shot Janet Leigh's face, hands, and feet, but everything else was body double stand-ins. And when it came time for the blood to swirl down the shower drain, they found that the fake red studio blood just didn't make it because it had a gray appearance in the black and white film. Albert Hitchcock, being the resourceful film director that he was, decided on Hershey's chocolate syrup. It looked better, and not only that, it enabled Janet Lee to climb out of the shower when she was done and lick her wounds. Now, if you look off to my side of the tram, you'll see a small pond there with a backdrop behind it. It almost looks like a drive-in movie theater screen. Now, we had to do that for the movie Jaws the Revenge from this past summer. Now, a lot of that film was shot in the Bahamas with the shark there, but some technical shots couldn't be done there. So what we did was painted a backdrop to resemble the Bahama sky and brought everyone right back a mountain horizon has been added to the backdrop, and there's an Amoco boathouse out in the center there. The reason for that is we're shooting a film on the lot right now called Big Country with Dan Aykroyd and John Candy. They were just there the other week filming a nighttime mountain lake exterior scene. We've now crossed over our highest point on the studio lot. We've crossed over 10,000 feet above sea level. As you can see, there's some snow on the ground. And unfortunately, the road ahead is blocked, so we're going to have to travel through a tunnel. And there is the danger of avalanches up here, so I request that everyone remains quiet. We don't want to lose anyone. But if something does happen, just hold on tight, shut your eyes, and I'm sure we'll pull through. We have our snow tires on. Oh, no. I see. <laughs>
glad that's over. Smoke in the factory's looking good. 
great, Bill. Stand by. Now, as you all just saw a moment ago, our stunt doubles for Crockett and Tubbs have managed to ruffle a few feathers here in Flamingo Land. And in this next scene, they move in to collect some hard, hard evidence. But our sleazy smugglers have other ideas. Something like a dynamite surprise party. All right, guys, stand by. Cameras are ready. Look at me. 
All right, doctor, bring over my carriage if you would, please. I got it, Kimmy. Take your places. This way. All right, smugglers, take your places. Again, ladies and gentlemen, this is where Crockett attempts to rescue his partner, Tubbs, from the hands of the smugglers. Thank you, Doc. <laughs> All right, Bill, how about another special effects job on this pair? All right, guys, standing by. Roll camera. And action! or driving a Ferrari, but when it comes to something real dangerous, the director will always call in a professional stunt double. Thanks, guys. Now, a lot of times a stunt double is hired because of his close physical resemblance to the star that he'll be doubling. Same hair color, height, weight, body frame, and most important, his build. Well, I personally have stood in many times for Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> you don't buy it either, huh? Well, you believe me, don't you? You do? Thanks, Mom. <laughs> no, but seriously, folks, don't attempt any of the stunts you see out here on your own. They are very dangerous and for professional stuntmen only. They go through a lot of training to make this look so easy. Now, a stunt you'll see in almost every film today is the high fall. Now, Kenny's going to take a hit and fall for about 25 feet. All right, Danny, take it on up. Now, we are a bit limited of how high we can go because, uh, well, our pool is only four feet deep. <laughs> oh, you didn't know that, Kenny? Always read the fine in your contract. <laughs> All right, Danny, that's good. Shut her down. Oh, Dan Danny, what are you doing? That's higher than what we need. Bring it back down to 25 feet. Now, as soon as we're set up, as I promised, Kenny's going to take that hit and spin into one of the most spectacular, agonizing, painful high falls ever recorded on film. On my gunshot. All right, Kenny, you ready? No! <laughs> Come on, be brave about it now. Make it look painful. Here we go. And action! Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> oh. oh my. <laughs> Not quite what I had in mind, but give him a big round of applause anyway. Nice dive, Kenny. Thank you. Well, folks, be sure to keep an eye out for Kenny in next year's Olympics. He'll be in the audience. <laughs> All right, guys, reset for the next scene. 
Now, while they're doing that, remember the Crockett and Tubbs have just escaped from our smugglers. Oh, but they're not through yet. In this next scene, they return in a new high-powered assault vehicle to wipe out the entire gang and that sleazy Caribbean crime boss. All right, guys, look alive. This is picture. We all set up over there? Bill, the effects if you would, please. Cameras are rolling. It's and action! You'll see. They're not out yet. Mr. Eddie 